You want to see this? I thought it was funny that IGN uploaded this. They uploaded this just like 11 days ago, but it's like a full breakdown on the very difficult boss from Phantom Liberty at the very beginning of it. And I, I find this fascinating. I love seeing behind the scenes stuff on game development. And if you are a member of the channel, if you're a member of any of this, go watch um, the member exclusive video. It's actually on the uh, the community member tab on Luke Stevens Live. So go check it out. But this is this is pretty fascinating. And it should make you appreciate a lot of the detail that they put in because it's it's quite it's quite impressive. They put a lot of work into this, okay? Just just take this in. Take this in. You wanna play rough? Gonna get rough. If you've played Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty, you'll no doubt remember the Chimera. It's a hulking, spider-like tank that chases you relentlessly, destroying every piece of the building around you before trapping you in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest boss fight in the whole game and was a monumentally complex sequence for developer CD Projekt Red to create. We wanted this boss fight to be the biggest and the most epic in the Cyberpunk game. We wanted to have this, you know, gigantic behemoth of robot that somehow is turning against you, but we didn't know at the, at the beginning how it's going to turn against you. You will not believe how many issues we had with this. Son of a bitch went haywire! So how was this intricate multi-stage mission put together? We spoke to multiple developers from across several different departments to find out what the joys and complications were. Oh. <laughs> This is how Phantom Liberty's Chimera encounter was built, from concept to controller. I love this stuff again, because it makes you really appreciate the labor that goes into it, the, the headaches that go into it. And you'll also hear some little tidbits about stuff that they thought they were going to do, and then they changed their mind and pivoted. So like, they'll talk about how there's like a, an access hatch, a door on the back of the, the Chimera that is still in the game today. Like if you play the game, you can see it. And it's because originally in the base design of the, the vehicle, there were going to be people inside. So they built it so they could get in and out of it. And then eventually they just cut it entirely, but that's just, you know, a remnant of it. And I love little stuff like that, where you find out that's why that's the way it is because it was originally different. And then, yeah, it, I, I love this stuff. Again, I eat it up. The Awakening. The thoroughly elaborate design process for the Chimera started with the most simple of propositions. Terminal is there, we connect to it. Uh, okay, now stay linked, says Somi. I need to establish a stable connection. What the F are we doing, says V. We look down through the balcony as there is a sound of movement down there. Kurt's men start entering the area. Spider Tank wakes up, drops the clothing he was covered with, turns to Kurt's men, starts mowing them down as it is now. Something is wrong. The Spider Tank kills anyone, everyone, but suddenly starts moving erratically. At some point, he turns towards us menacingly. Somi, asks V. No response. Get the F out of there, shouts Myers. The player needs to unplug or he dies. We unplug, run downstairs. Myers is there waiting. As we walk down, the tank crashes through the wall. Myers starts running away. The objective to run appears with the map and on the other side of the room. We run as the tank shoots across the room. We see him creating a hole in the wall. We run there. All this is exactly how it turned out, but this is how it starts. It just starts with these quick sketches and then kind of the ideation phase. And then they actually go and build it. And again, I just, I eat this stuff up. A big boss battle with a big boss tank. I had a very small brief and it was something like this. We want to do a boss fight that will be a spider tank. Internally, we always refer to it as a spider tank, but in fact, it's not a spider because it has six legs. So it's not really a spider and it's not actually a tank because it doesn't have a crew. So Chimera fits better. For a moment, we became this kind of military designers creating a tank, right? And figuring out how with this advanced technology, how we will be designing this device so it could actually potentially operate in the real time. At the beginning, we didn't have this almost claustrophobic environment in, uh, in mind. So we also thought about maybe we can have this tank jumping around but we decided that we wanted something heavier, something scary. 
That desire for heft and weight informed the complete look of the Chimera. It was built to impose itself on both the tight confines of its surroundings and the player, who is tiny by comparison. We thought that, that it would be perfect. With this kind of man versus the machine, David versus the Goliath uh, moment where we have to, as a single person, fight with something so massive and elaborate and powerful. We didn't have a perfect gameplay idea at the beginning, so we started with many legs, high legs, something uh, smaller, something bigger. When one of those sketches were chosen, we were like, okay, now we, we need to block it out so we have a very rough 3D model so they can test it in the level. That one was a little bit more similar to the final one. And I tried to keep the shape as similar to that block out, even when I started adding details in 3D and, uh, you know, make it more believable, more like a real tank. So there was a lot of iterations on even an accomplished model of changing something, you know, replacing uh, things, adding range of motion, you know, tweaking something so it, it has a capability of rotating faster, moving faster, etc. Uh, adding grenade launchers, eventually adding also the gr drone compartments, which were not part of the original design, but it was needed to add an additional phase of the combat in the, in the third stage of, of boss fight. But despite neither being a spider nor a tank in the end, the eagle-eyed among you will be able to spot some remnants of the original design that remain to this day. If you look closely at the design of the tank, and if you look at the rear section, there's a quite big door. At the beginning, we didn't know that we are not going to use a crew. So that door was supposed to be the opening for the crew, but we ended up having a huge drone, essentially, and the door is still there. I just, again, this is for a DLC expansion. Like, this is not even like one of the final boss fights in the base game. This was how they started a $30 expansion. Such high effort went into it. It's wild. Being an automated machine rather than a crude vehicle allows the Chimera to move in a more animalistic way. Unhindered by the limitations of humanity, its motions are free to be animated in a way that better reflects its natural world influences. We were mostly relying on scorpions, beetles, things that have six legs because it's very important to, you know, pick up the balance on how he's moving, the, you know, the motion, the body motion that Chimera is showing through the entire sequence, how heavy it's gonna be, uh, always having some uh, contact point on one of the legs so, you you know, it doesn't unbalance. We need to figure out how to add a little mechanical flavor on top of it because it's a robot in the end, right? And it's made of mechanical parts. So that's why, for example, we try to have the turret and the main body stabilized and only the lower body with the legs is what is moving around. That gives us two things. First of all, it gives you the feeling of it's a machine and he's trying to, you know, stabilize the camera around you to follow you better or to target you better with the tracking systems. But at the same time, always when there is some movement on the body and a stabilized head, Traditionally, an animation and body motion gives you a creepy feeling, so it's something unsettling, which adds to this horror vibe that we have, right? That animalistic yeah, yet mechanical feel would also need to be conveyed in the way the metal monster would be heard. As such, noises were engineered to sound like nothing else, an amalgamation of natural, digital, and demonic worlds. So we wanted the Chimera to sound mechanical, but not fully robotic. We wanted to be also um, something like alive. The robotic growls help a lot, lot with this. And also as the sequence progresses, the vocalization of the camera changes from friendly one to really like a almost demonic black hole sound. The Black Wall is the corruption at the core of Songbird's story in Phantom Liberty. As such, it needed to sound like an overwhelming force eating away whatever it came into contact with, be that the hulking Chimera or Somi herself. It's an audio hellscape she nor the player can escape. I think the coolest and the most interesting thing, thing about Black Wall and how it sounds is that it wasn't supposed to be futuristic sci-fi. It's supposed to be, like the descriptors I got from both the narrative director and the lead cinematic designers, they were talking about shamanistic sounds, cyber monsters. Uh, essentially, you would need to create sounds of cyber hell. A lot of it came down to figuring out some synthetic uh, sources that actually sound animalistic and then making them a little bit more cybernetic. So for example, chopping them down into super Dude, small- The sound design in stuff. Cyberpunk is just so, so they, good. The music like, too. Glitching out when they're like, it's gotten a lot of praise. It deserves more. Are it, they are so good. That they're aggressive.
Further inspirations for the sound of the black wall came from other non-audio departments working on the sequence. This collaboration was made possible thanks to a completely new organisational system, implemented by CD Projekt Red after the release of Cyberpunk 2077. The Spider and the Fly, the mission in which the Chimera appears, was a big test subject for this new way of working. It was a bit tricky from our side because it, it was the first time in the company that we were uh, divided into what is called content teams. So it's like a multidisciplinary team based on, uh, you know, every discipline that we want to create this sequence. So and this, this is the part to pay attention to. We've talked about this before. We've done segments on it and stuff. But basically, after the troubles of cyberpunk, the staff were divided into new types of teams. What it used to be, and we've, again, we've been through this, so I'll be, I'll be brief and, and quick with it. But basically, what it used to be is that you would have each department kind of did its own thing and then they would each work on a, a portion of the game individually improving stuff and shifting stuff forward and then it gets moved to another team and then they pass it off for approval to this team and each time it moves from department to department it gets new signatures and then you know once it's passed off it moves on to the next one and what they did what they found was that there was a lot of wasted time where like the the concept team would here and then they move it forward to here and then the the like quest designers they start writing out what the quest is going to be they pass it forward then the modeling crew they go through and they set up the scene and they model whatever they need to do for the environment they pass it forward to the the materials team and then they pass it forward here and then the cinematics team is like okay we're doing the cinematics but big problem big problem you have as part of your concept this character doing something their model can't do or that the rig just isn't prepared for so we can either work on that for a while or you can just change it and it's going to be cheaper to change it and faster to change it so they send it all the way back to the questing team and then they rework it and then it goes again and again and passes here maybe this time it gets all the way here but then something the lighting needs to be changed so they pass it all the way back to the lighting team and that's go through these waves of approvals again then oh something else is wrong we gotta send it back here and so there's just a ton of wasted time going through the same approval process over and over again too much bureaucracy so what they changed it to is if each one of these is a color if yellow's here if green is here if blue is here you know if if purple's here what they did is they just made new teams so now they have individual teams like this with one member of that team and that discipline one guy from here one guy from there one person from here and so now this individual team can do everything they needed all these teams to do but they can do it individually they don't need to wait for approvals they can just go ask tim over here what they need to do to fix this and tim fixes it and then tim's like oh rebecca we need this changed rebecca fixes it and then johnny needs to fix this thing and so he fixes it and then like oh we need more programmers okay well we'll just add in another uh, another programmer way more efficient way more efficient and that's what he's referring to here is this was the first time they worked in these content teams and it works way better so everyone kind of participate into the design into their own ideas into indirectly and indirectly around this so we have environment artists we have animators we have designers we have gameplay we have level design so everything together to create the best uh, you know, approach to this. So starting with this pre-visualization, we try to move forward and explore ideas together to see, you know, if this is working, if it's not working, what we need and where. So trust me, it was a very, very, very intricate process. Such iterations are a prime example of how CDPR's content teams work. Members of every design department needed to be in constant conversation with one another to ensure that the visual design and animation all worked in concert with the sequence's gameplay goals. We needed to have this heaviness, this, this weight that leads tons of you know, steel uh, chasing you. Uh, but at the same time, later we have a boss fight, so we have to balance it out with gameplay that has other requirements, right? Because this is for me, the, this sequence is for me, uh, one of the biggest achievements we did in terms of blending gameplay with cinematics. We try to all the time totally uh, mix in those two in several you know, intensities during the whole sequence. Blending gameplay with cinematics is something that Cyberpunk does elegantly. CDPR aims to never fully take control away from the player, even when a scripted scene is playing out in front of them. It is a finely tuned set piece that demanded a tight relationship between the gameplay and cinematic star. And 
I don't think we'll get time to look at it today, but I have another video for us to watch at some point. This one right here of Will Shen and Daryl Brigner. And these two guys are two of the former, uh, like head quest people at Bethesda Game Studios. Will Shen is in a lot of the promotional materials for Starfield. It doesn't work there anymore. He left and is working at something Wicked Games, which is made up of a bunch of Bethesda veterans and stuff. In this talk, they discuss a lot of their development process for making quests and levels and stuff in Bethesda Games. And they basically describe how things got the way they are today, which is really out of control in terms of the bureaucracy and the multiple levels of of approvals and, and all of this stuff. It's really, really fascinating. Really, really fascinating. And I think that Cyberpunk, they had the same problems when they launched Cyberpunk 2077 as Bethesda does now, where there's just a ton of inefficiencies, stuff slips through the cracks, and you end up with baffling things that happen, like having a DLC that you pay, you charge seven bucks for, but the gun that's a reward for that quest doesn't even reload properly for players for months after it launched. How does that even happen? It happens with those waves and waves of inefficiencies that we discussed where some bug was missed like back here, but because it went past that approval and went through all of these extra waves and never made it back there, they didn't catch it. And then in order to fix it, they have to go from the approval process, send it all the way back. And then it has to go all the way through again, which takes time. Again, just inefficient. Whereas here they could just send it here. Tim fixes the bug. It goes out to everybody. So I, I've been hoping that BGS would look at the lessons that CDPR learned. They've given these talks at games or at uh, at the GDC events and stuff. They've talked very openly about it, but they're not going to make changes unless they think something's wrong. And that seems to be the, the pretty clear thing is that BGS doesn't think anything's wrong. This is like one example when the tank is rising up for the first time in the in, in this room with the cloth tarp and he's shooting at you. So he's actually starting to shoot at you in the middle also of his animation that makes him go to gameplay. You know, normally you would have like cut, like a fade out and fade in, or maybe something will glitch at the, at the transition from uh, gameplay to scene. And in Cyberpunk, in the, especially in this sequence, we always strive for making it invisible, basically. And the fact that you ask me which parts are cinematic means that I did my job well, because it's just unnoticeable. Almost the whole sequence, except for maybe just the fight itself, which is completely gameplay driven, is actually a cinematic sequence. Some which is part of what makes Phantom Liberty so good. And that's why I will stress to you and everybody else in chat who's played it, I'm sure will stress to you as well. You gotta try it because it is as close to a playable cinematic for an entire expansion as you can get. Same with like, honestly, the base game of Cyberpunk 2077 at this point after the 2.0 update is at that level. It's very, very impressive. They did a ton of work on it and they deserve that credit. Again, should have been like that at launch, but I think you still got to acknowledge where it is today. Sometimes intertwined with gameplay, just for example, when Tank is shooting down the Kurt's enemies on the balcony, this is a cinematic anima animation. There are dialogues being played by the characters. There are even like contextual animations played on V where, where she's covering her face from the missiles. But the soldiers that are on the balconies actually have gameplay behavior, but we did it in a way that the turret swipe is so, let's say, meticulous that they will die anyways. So it's kind of a risky mix we did, but it worked out in the end. From here, the mission transports you from the wide open museum space to a tight corridor, made even more claustrophobic by the presence of the Chimera hunting you down. It's a chase sequence built on the principle of knowing when to pick your battles. The tank is too powerful to take down by yourself, and if you try, you'll learn that the hard way. On your feet! We kind of try to make sure that it's impossible to fight with it. Even if you approach in that moment, uh, probably he's gonna kill you. There are several fail states that we create along the whole sequence, right? And that one is the first one. But I will say 90% of the players run away the first time, right? Because it's too scary. While running forward may be a simple enough task for the player though, it was far from easy for CDPR to make work in this environment. The chase part was uh, a challenge in that regard, where we had to align the speed of the tank 
which wasn't an easy task to do because it was completely animation driven. So any change in his uh, movement would require some animation tweaks also. Align that with how fast the player can go because the player can be a bit faster or a bit slower. And for every type of your build, it still needs to work and it still needs to feel like he's right on your toes, but he can never catch you if you're actively running uh, from him. Animation-wise, it was a bit of a challenge to put this gigantic beast inside the corridor because it's pretty difficult to make him move. So we decided that he's destroying everything on his path. It was the best way to, you know, first create this horror feeling. And if you look back in that corridor, which is funny because, you know, I animated kind of everything with the chimera moving forward, right? And destroying everything on, on its path. And probably 99% of the players now look back, which is kind of sad for me, but also, as well it's kind of successful, right? Because yeah, they are scared. They are genuinely scared. But the chase isn't just... I do love the idea of they're like, it's really hard to animate it, moving around objects through these hallways and stuff. They're like, so what if he just doesn't? <laughs> what if he just moves through? <laughs> Maybe we do that. <laughs> it's about scaring the player. It's also about preparing them for what's ahead. One of the goals in the sequence for us was to foreshadow as much of the stuff the tank is doing as it is possible. Like for example, you shouldn't be close to it. Like being close to it means death. He has a turret that is deadly. He has a laser swipe that is also deadly. So then when you actually fight him, you know what a given attack is because we sold it already through the sequence that precedes it. Before the big fight though, comes a long fall. A floor shattering descent through concrete and metal, this incredibly complicated transition scene posed some of the biggest technical challenges of the whole sequence. The fall. The fall. Done. Key, thank you for the five. If you had one shot, one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted, that you wanted one moment, would you capture it or just let it slip? Yo. Insert verse. Thank you for that. It was kind of my own personal baby, actually. I wanted to create a bigger action sequence instead of just falling. So I took some inspiration, actually, from some other places, like, for example, the Uncharted 4 Clock Tower sequence. Like, you know, you are trying to grab for your life in everything you find. Right? We have these cables, we have, you are on top of the tank again, and you have to jump out, you don't arrive, and everything is crumbling around you. And at the same time, to give this a scale, I had another inspiration that I like a lot. Gandalf falling with Balrog from Bridge of Casa Doom. So it's like mm. this massive falling, but you are still kind of fighting, and you have this, you know, behemoth on your side, so that you're falling, that you're watching falling with you, right? And there were a couple of inspirations there to fight with it and, you know, in the end, try to achieve this result of insane action sequence that it was very, very difficult from an animation point of view to, to achieve, actually. For the longest time, we couldn't really make it work, really. On the reviews that we had, we, got, we, we needed to be like, this will work eventually, please trust us, we will make it happen. But there were some sort of tricks that we had to, uh, to do there. Uh, for example, when V is falling down through the air, when you actually would fall, uh, you would fall much faster. But we had to kind of fake it a bit uh, to achieve better effect and to make it uh, also readable. Because in, in sequences, especially uh, first person ones, everything that you see is dictated by your, you know, perceivable angle of vision. We really had to be careful on what we present and how for the player to even understand what's happening with him in that sequence and achieving that yeah, wasn't wasn't an easy task and it went through many many iterations how do you plan for an animation pro i also just love the idea that something as simple as falling through a chasm is like this huge headache because it's it's that stuff that players take for granted myself included to be clear that i i find is often the most impressive and and interesting like there's so many things that you would think oh well no you just you just fall through the hole and then you do a couple quick time events trying to grab on stuff and then you land on the floor beneath you but for them like that's the most difficult like that that was the biggest headache is actually trying to tie those things together i just find that fascinating you know and they still chose to do it because they could have just had it so like Oh, you fall into a cloud of smoke and then you land on the ground and the cloud of smoke dissipates and that covered up the transition so they didn't have to worry about that. Like they could have done that easy little fix, but didn't have to worry about it. You know, Front of view Just falling worked. through three floors. If Bethesda attempted this, there'd be loading screens every five seconds. There would, let's be honest, there wouldn't have been a chimera to begin with. You would have fought more humanoids that you'd already fought before because that's what they did. 
they had the chance to do something crazy cool like that for shattered space they signal a gigantic space serpent that they all worship many times you know what you do you fight more humanoids but these ones are glittery which makes them new give us 30 dollars please <laughs> in motion capture, right? So what we did is we had an incredible stunt team. We kind of divided into several clips. So you have your fall, it's, everything is recorded actually in motion capture, which looks insane, but everything is recorded like from the ground level, of course, we're not throwing anyone three cross down. Later, we have to cut and clip everything, cut and paste every single bit so it makes sense, but with the same timing and with the same pacing that we have before. And it was incredible to work with that, uh, but it was kind of a gigantic puzzle to build all these animation clips while at the same time having this Chimera keyframe animated on top of it. Try to sync everything, it was a bit difficult, but very rewarding in the end. So this was a very close collaboration with cinematic designers as well to try and nail that timing together with this insane action sequence. What looks like a simple fall actually turned out to be the most complicated part of the sequence for the cinematics team. Assuring that the most scripted of events looks reactive is an art that they put a lot of time and effort into perfecting. Nothing there is uh, procedural. Everything that was needed to be directed by us and put in a very specific deliberate place or like uh, the distraction that is happening at the very precise moment. Like when you're falling through that concrete floor, the smoke needed to go off at the very pre precise specific moment the pieces of debris needed to clear out for you to be able to see where you're falling. And it needed to be clear that you, you know, fall down on the tank and roll off from it. So putting this specific part of the sequence was certainly the most challenging, but also the most fun. While this sequence delivers cinematic spectacle in spades, Cyberpunk is a video game, not a movie. As such, it's important that there are still flashes of interactivity through the most scripted of scenes. Not paying attention, deadly quick time events will make you pay the price. Squish. We tried to flat line. But this is this is why we stress like how important it is to be hungry, right? As developers, because if you're hungry and you're like, we need to prove something, you make this kind of thing. Because again, like the the path, the easier path was there. Even for that falling sequence, they could have just said, this is a headache. This is gonna take us weeks to figure out. Is anybody really gonna care? Like, does, does it really matter? The answer is probably no. Like if players don't have that, if players don't have the cool falling sequence, they won't know they're missing it. So will they care? Not really. They'll, they'll feel less impressed than if you did it, but will they really care? Probably not. And that's the philosophy of, I think a lot of studios, not just, I mean, we point to BGS because Shattered Space is the most recent thing to point to, but uh, a lot of companies will do this where it's like, why why try that extra 110%? Why, why push themselves to that 110% point if 100% or 90% is enough? For CDPR, they needed to prove something with the expansion. They needed to prove something. They wanted to, to show that they... They still had it. Um, and that's what they did, I think. I think. Whereas for a lot of other companies, I think if they feel like they are, they are where they need to be and they, they just need to do enough, then you get lackluster products at the end of it. Because they don't need to push themselves. They don't need to try that extra bit. Let's see, Mr. Steel, kill thing for the five. I watched both of Maddie's videos on Shattered Space. Even though he was very disappointed with Bethesda's DLC, those videos were very good. Good. Yeah, I, I've seen some people try to go after him and be like, he's he's just flipping, he's trying to get PlayStation Cloud or whatever. It's like, guys, not everything is, is a console war thing. Like sometimes you just were hoping for a good expansion and you got a lackluster one. That's it. Like sometimes that's all it is. You thought this was gonna be amazing and it turned out to be mediocre. And so you're disappointed. Like most YouTubers are also gamers too. Most YouTube gamers, I mean, uh, like, sure there's some where it's like do you do you play video games anymore like do you actually play stuff or are you just rambling about stuff are you just whining about stuff but the vast majority of people who make youtube videos and have been running channels for a decade on video games they're gamers at their core and so they're going to be disappointed by some releases they're going to be bummed out by stuff because they're fans too like do you think i'm thrilled that assassin's creed has been taking a nosedive no because I grew up playing Assassin's Creed. I ate it up. I loved it. Seeing them fall this far is pretty disappointing. It's pretty sad. 
you know, so I'm bummed by it. I guess I'm just used to it. <laughs> Whereas I think a lot of maybe BGS fans are not used to it yet, at least. You know, for me, it's like there's a new Assassin's Creed game coming out. I'm like, yeah, it's probably going to be like a seven or an eight. Maybe. So to find out that it looks like a seven or it looks like a six, I'm like, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> I'm just like, to me, it's not a surprise at all anymore. <laughs> To never take the full control from the player for too long it's kind of like a rule like a philosophy of ours like there cannot be too long uh, scenes basically and so on top of it being already difficult and containing multiple elements to piece together to work in perfect sync we also made it so that you can get hit by the turret if you don't react quickly if you don't manage to grab the cables you will bounce off them basically and if you don't dodge the spider tank's leg get crushed by it. We wanted to kind of test the, the streamers a bit that uh, that sometimes during the scenes they just tend to look at the chat maybe, not pay full attention to what's happening on, on the screen. In, in this case, uh, and actually we uh, witnessed it several times, they just died in, in the middle of the scene because they, they weren't paying attention. No. That's exactly what I'm talking about Stupid when, streamers. when we talk about scenes in Cyberpunk. You can never really look away. You can never put down your gamepad and just uh, witness the event. The biggest challenge for the player was yet to come, however. After landing, the briefest of respites is granted so that you may gain a bearing of your surroundings. Savor those few seconds, though, because it's the calm before the biggest storm Cyberpunk has to offer. What was previously seemingly indestructible is now weakened, but that doesn't mean it won't put up one hell of a boss fight. That transition where it starts shaking, it's behind me, isn't it? I love that. It's so good. It's so good. Kevin, thank you for the five. And how much did this DLC cost? Same as Shattered Space. This is why Phantom Liberty went on to win awards and was loved by the majority of those who played it. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's just, this is why, like, again, there are some things you can look at subjectively. Like, do you like the writing in a Shattered Space versus a... a Phantom Liberty. You like the Bethesda writing more? Okay, that's a subjective opinion. You're allowed to think that. That's fine. Maybe you find the art style of the NASA Punk Starfield thing more interesting than Cyberpunk. Okay, that's a personal preference. That's a subjective thing. That's fine. You're allowed to do that. But there are things that we can objectively qualify and quantify. We can look at the value in the expansions gameplay time, unique assets, things like cutscenes, things like the broader production value, big set piece encounters like this one. We can quantify those things, count them up and compare them. And there is a right answer as to which one is more impressive with those offerings. And that's where I think, you know, if people stick their heads in the sand and pretend like it's, it's not the case, then you just end up looking silly. And that's kind of where I think a lot of the, the people that jumped on me a couple days ago are at now where they were like, no, no, the only reason you're done with it is because you rushed through it. And then like everybody else that finished it is also like, yep, it's really short and not very good. Even like the hardcore Xbox fans or BGS fans are like, this ain't it fam. So now what do they say? Everybody's bought off. Everybody rushed it. Everybody like if you, if you stay committed to that narrative, you just end up looking pretty silly. You know, just how it is. That's the part where cinematics gets in and how do we cripple and try to damage this tank in any shape or form, right? I think specifically in terms of price, it was, I think this was 40, Shadow Space is 30. I think some jurisdictions, jurisdictions, some uh, markets, it was the same price depending on currencies. So I think it depends on where you live, but similar ballpark. So we managed to do the, all this whole chase, giving you the feeling and the illusion that it's a tough enemy and you cannot face it like this. But after the fall, maybe, you know, you had a intense fall that helped you, you know, destroy his defenses a little bit. So you can now face the tank. The fight itself tasks you with taking on the Chimera and its many, many different weapons. It's here that the design of the tank and the design of the gameplay scenario all comes full circle, with gameplay influencing visual design and vice versa. On the early production of Phantom Liberty, combat was supposed to happen on the street level. So we were thinking about the range combat, larger distances, big arena. Eventually, in the process of designing the expansion, we decided that it would be all held inside the buildings, right? And eventually in the abandoned metro station, which kind of changed 
change the perspective. The first actual iterations of that boss fight were more navigating around, sneaking around the tank, tank was moving on its own. We didn't have time to do this and at the same time create this horror vibe of chasing you if you open a space straight ahead from the beginning. So the first limitation was like, he's not gonna have a proper locomotion on its own. Locomotion meaning he's gonna move on itself around. So we knew that we wanted kind of circular arena so that he reaches to you with all his arsenal, but he doesn't actually really needs to approach you. So he's rotating kind of its own in the middle. When we ended up with the design of uh, closing our arenas in the interiors, it completely changed the game, right? So we needed to, to adjust a few things. But there was like a constant negotiation with the gameplay team. Basically, the gameplay team at the beginning, I remember, they wanted to have like a really fast and agile robot that runs over the, the ceiling, the walls, and it's all over the place. And we wanted to have something super heavy, static, you know, slow, kind of inspired by Ghost in the Shell. Finding the compromise, it was, it took us a lot, quite a time, right? Of, of, but what we found it was negotiating, meeting, talking, you know, designing, experimenting, making storyboards, also repromatics, etc. The device itself, which is kind of designed to kind of fight on the medium and long range, now has to deal with us, the small opponent, which is kind of walking, running around their feet. So we had to, we made a lot of adjustments of what kind of weapons it should use, for example, and how it should operate. There's many weapons on that tank and some of them very late. For example, we find out that being, I don't want to say completely static, but in the middle of the, of the level, if the character goes too close to it, you can keep shooting. So we added this beam just to make the layer go far away from it. We had this case of the laser weaponry uh, in the base game uh, when we were fighting uh, Roy's boss fight. So he was basically using this laser weapon that can sweep uh, through the environment. Uh, so with the Chimera, we wanted to do it times 10. And what we aim here for is this constant feeling of the threat but also it needed to give the player information that the laser gun is winding up to, so, so to give them a chance to basically hide behind the cover and avoid the damage. Watch the laser! Take cover! Yeah, even little touches, like you notice how it always starts pretty much as far away from the player as you could. Which, in the context of a giant Chimera military robot, probably doesn't make sense. Like it knows where you are, it's shooting at you. So you'd expect the laser beam would just beam right to you or at least in your general area and then just go va 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 and that's the sound it makes apparently. And just, you know, chop you up. But because they're designing a video game, they have to communicate to the player, this is coming, prepare, get behind cover or prepare to jump, whatever it may be. And so they can, like they, they have to communicate that. that like these are the little things I love about video game design is just planning out those little touches where if you're just playing the game in the hectic moment, you probably don't think about it too much. But when you pause you're like, oh, wait, why would it start the laser beam so far away from me? It's because they have to communicate to the player that it's coming and all of those little bitty things. I, I love it. It wasn't just the Chimera's weapons that needed to be tweaked over time though. Its armor also needed redesigning. Once we had a blockout, I knew that we needed armor. So I started designing the armor and what's underneath the armor and which places we wanted to be destroyed because we also worked with weak spots and we wanted to, you know, reveal them. We used the Kiroshi eyes to reveal them. So you just need to scan and you see them. So I didn't really need, you know, to make them yellow or too obvious. It would be also kind of stupid for a weapon to show his weak spots. So using the Kiyoshi eyes, it's a fantastic solution. It's another great example of gameplay and art design working in tandem, and it and other similar combinations all build to the fight's grand finale. After exploiting the Chimera's weak spots and disabling it in spectacular fashion, it's time to deal the killing blow. That finisher, involving the tank's beating mechanical heart, is the perfect example of every department of the content team coming together. We wanted this feeling to slowly, over the course of the sequence, to, to shift and make you as a player feel more and more in power. Finally, the finisher, we wanted to do this kind of a exclamation point uh, after the boss fight to really make the tank go out with the bang. The gameplay guys asked me kind of late in the production that they wanted something to be used by the player. I was kind of lucky the hard case because I had just the spot for it. So 
yeah, I got lucky there. So there's a cylinder in the top with a hatch that you can open, take the heart, it looks like a heart, in fact, and uh, toss it, destroy it. And we want it to be uh, the heart to sound consistent with the Chimera approach to sound design when it needs to sound organic or mechanical at the same time. There's a really cool thing and the details in it when you just open the hatch and you can actually start hearing the heart beating and then once you grab it and you rip it off, um, you can hear it's basically dying. And then there's a really cool thing when V just throws the heart and it lands on the ground. So we have this Chimera core that resembles a heart. I didn't realize that they had two different animations depending on whether you had the Mantis blades or not. That just broke my brain. Because I, I usually have the Mantis blades equipped, which they showed in the previous clip of, you know, cutting in and ripping it out that way. But then they also have it, so if you don't have the Mantis Blades, you just reach in and grab it and pull it. Attention to detail. It's amazing. Let's all appreciate it. It's so cool. And that was kind of a conversation internally because we said like, what looks cooler than having a, you know, <laughs> a beating heart of your enemy in your hand before you finish it off, right? And it's kind of the... A metaphor we wanted to, to do there. And later it was super cool because as well with this content team, uh, multidisciplinary team, we managed to even make it a piece of loot. So later you can craft something out of it. So it's just a very cool ending for it. We all need to come together and that's why we work like this in CDPR, that we are in those content teams because every iteration is an improvement on, on what we did and every improvement is a holistic thing. Rust and piss, shit bot! Teamwork does in fact make the dream work. But what mm -hmm. aspect of the mission are the developers most in awe of from outside their own departments? I was impressed by not the, only the tank itself, but how the scene looked. You know, uh, bringing all together and feel like uh, we worked well as a team, I think is the best. I think I was the most impressed by the amount of destruction we squeezed into the sequence because it was, I couldn't believe it that they said that they will make everything indestructible. I was like, how that's even possible? But they already made it. So that was pretty impressive. Every single pillar is being destroyed. It was assumption from the gameplay that they wanted, they needed every single cover to be destructible to show the force, right? And not make player hide behind the, 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 the column and just, you know, slowly shoot to the aspire to lower his, his health bar, right? They wanted play. Yeah, imagine how different the encounter would be if the pillars were not destructible. The chimera is stationary, so it would just unload on you, and then you just peek out, shoot it, hide behind the cover. Peek out, shoot it, hide behind the cover. You know, like, it's uh, another example of how if you give players an exploit or an ability to, to utilize some tool to make the game easier, they'll use it because players are resourceful like that. But by making the environments destructible, it totally changes the encounter. You're constantly moving around, you're constantly like running around, totally changes it. Player to actually face the, the, the tank and force the player to actually, to act. Michal Bresniak, the cinematic designer, man, this, this scene was just, with the tools we have in engine, this was a big challenge to set up everything and made it work from every point of view, from blending gameplay with cinematics, from managing all the dialogues, all the screaming around, all the sound, like he's kind of was the master orchestrator and putting everything together, right? VFX obviously are a huge part of that and the whole identity of the tank when it comes to the black hole AIs that are taking over him. The way it is presented of him, the way he has those, you know, black and red pieces of, of corruption on him. The audio, of course, that, that makes him so menacing and uh, and scary, basically. The danger is kind of already there because of the awesome visuals and then you have this awesome driving track by P.P. Adamczyk that's also keeping you on the edge, so our job was pretty easy. <laughs> So, in a level full of towering machines, crumbling architecture, and complex scripting, you'd maybe expect something explosive to be the biggest challenge the team faced. Well, turns out it's actually all in the much smaller details. Small things, actually, was to make Myers' rifle be attached to her back when it was necessary. You will not believe how many issues we had with this one. We either had two rifles attached to her back, sometimes the rifle was going directly through her head. This was probably the biggest issue um, for us in this entire sequence, the small rifle from Myers. If you look at our game, there's never a situation where characters put the guns on their back. It just doesn't happen. But she has a rifle and since this is a um, you know, main story, we didn't want to create this artificiality where the rifle is just 
disappearing when she's putting her away. So we had to come up with a method of her putting the rifle on her back and then taking it again seamlessly up. See what I mean though? Like the little details that you would just take for granted. Her putting the rifle on her back. You would not guess that that was the most difficult thing. You would not guess that. But that ends up being the most difficult thing at all. Like it's it's so fascinating to me. I love it. It's yeah, I just eat this up. What is this? Starfield 2? <laughs> oh, they wish. I don't know. Maybe by the year 2052, when Starfield 2 comes out, maybe it'll look like this. I don't know. Point we had it easier because uh, Myers at the beginning had a pistol, not a rifle. So it was simple. Like, right, she would just hide it in her pants and, and that's it, uh, the end of the story. But no, it was decided that she needs to have a rifle and the rifle then needs to be a reward for the player that you can also get. Hawk? I, I, I'm sorry, guys. I was going to try to make a Hawk to a joke and be like, Oh, the rifle's name is Hawk. I wonder if the, if the like mount, whatever holster is called Tua or something. We, we all were thinking it. We all were thinking it. Let's be honest. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah. You're not better than me. You're all the same. <laughs> and it created a bit of a complication for us, uh, but it was, it was all fun. All fun and games. Apologies. All fun and games and months and months of hard work. The Chimera encounter is one of the standout moments of Cyberpunk 2077. A complicated beast at the heart of the Phantom Liberty expansion that wouldn't have come together without all of the different disciplines at CD Projekt Red combining forces tightly. It's a mission with as much heart put in as is taken out of its central beast, and as cool as the metal panels that shield it. For more Cyberpunk, check out our mm. review of the Phantom Liberty expansion, and for everything else, stick with IGN. So good. So, so good. I eat it up. And I just, I, I love learning about these little details that are not intuitive, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't think would be the case, you know? That's what I, I love. Mm -hmm.